The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome. Welcome to Barhaven United Church. My name is Reverend Carla Van Dellen, and here we are. Here we are. Whenever you're watching this, it doesn't matter if it's a Saturday night, Sunday morning, midweek, this is your Sabbath time. Your time to rest into God's Word, your time of opening to God's Spirit, and to be present to whatever may be stirring in you at this time. So welcome to Sabbath time. Friends, today we are also celebrating something very major. We are celebrating National Indigenous Day within the United Church of Canada. In our worship, we will praise God for the beauty found in all of creation and within all our neighbors, those we call our brothers, our sisters, co-workers, friends, and family. We will contemplate our relationship with the world around us and with our Indigenous neighbors of what they can teach us and how everything relates to one another in this wonderful world that we all call home. This is the third and final service in this June centered around our Indigenous relations, but that doesn't mean that the opportunities for learning and exploring the past and the present conditions that many Indigenous people find themselves living in needs to stop with this service. This week, the outreach ministry of this congregation offers another newsletter full of resources and information for you to continue learning and exploring the many Indigenous issues that are, that are part of life. We also have a library of, a very extensive library actually, of Indigenous themed books here at BUC that you may find insightful. And if you'd like to borrow one, just contact Natalie in the church office and, uh, and she's in on a Friday, so you can arrange a time to come in and to have a look. Last week, we also invited you to place a heart written with a prayer on it in our heart garden out at the front of the church below the cross. And there are many hearts right now in the garden with prayers for our Muslim neighbors and in memory of all the children that were lost to residential schools. So I encourage you to come by and to read them and just spend a moment with them and to perhaps participate in the small act of solidarity and of prayer. And as we worship this day, may we also give thanks to God for the many people who've been father figures to us on this Father's Day weekend. And these people in our lives that have so much to teach us, they come into our lives through many ways. It could be through conception or adoption, but whoever you call a father, let us celebrate them and hold them up in prayer on this day. So friends, let us worship as a faith-filled and joyous community of faith. Let us just take a few moments to sit in the silence, to be present to whatever is moving within you, and to be open for whatever message God may have for us, for us this day. Let us just be. Friends, if you're following along at home, we now move to lighting our Christ candle. The light of Christ infuses the universe, all living things, all inanimate matter, all our relations are knitted together with the divine at their core. May our souls burn a little bit brighter when we realize that in our neighbor, God is present. May it be so with Christ's help. Amen.
we begin with our call to worship. Be still my soul and wait for God. From God comes my salvation. God alone is my rock. I shall never be shaken. On God rests our deliverance and our honor. My mighty rock, my refuge, my strength is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. In love, we pour out our hearts before the Lord, our God. Let us pray. Holy One, you are our rock, a foundation upon which we stand. Fill our hearts now with joy at your deep abiding presence. Encourage us by the teachings of Christ to live with care and compassion for self, friend, and neighbor. Bless us now as we reflect in our relations with Indigenous peoples, our King, as diverse yet united peoples. Amen. I went for a walk on a bright sunny day. The south wind was gently blowing through Nogmas's braids and whispering in my ears as to tell a story. We came upon a spider's web. The little insect was working so diligently to piece together her home with a most magnificent design. As we sat on the grass and watched Cespica weave her net of magnificent shapes, Nokmas told me all about the web and how we're all connected. The circle of life represents all of Mother Earth. The honor and respect we show the sacred circle also honors the four-legged, the winged ones, the crawlers, and all the bugs. The birch bark tree also contributes with purpose so that the little spider and have something to connect her home to. Nokmis also said that within the circle of life, the plant spirits live. So we must honor and show respect to the trees, bushes, flowers, and grasses. Nokmis told me that when you hold a stone in your hand, you hold the foundations of the web of life. It is the first order of beings upon which all beings depend for life. The trees, grasses, and flowers receive their life from the rocks, waters, and air. Plants are the second order of beings. The animal spirits depend on them. Animals are the third order of beings. The animal spirit gives her own flesh so the younger brother, the human, can live. Humans are the fourth order of beings. These are the four order of beings in the circle of life, each interwoven with the other. We must sing a song to all that is in the circle of life. 
our song is sent by the north wind to the star peoples, our ancestors, and to all that the web represents. Giving thanks to Mother Earth and Father Sky for all things in life. Nokmis and I sat watching Sespica build her home. Nokmis pulled out her pouch and gave Sespica some tobacco and thanks for the teachings that she gave to us. Nokmis and I continued on our journey, looking for herbs to make tea. We came upon a clearing in the bush, surrounded the clearing were cedar trees, and within the clearing ran a stream. Nokmis walked up to the old man's cedar and offered tobacco for some cedar boughs for her tea. We then rested by a stream in the clearing. Nokmis asked me to select seven rocks from the stream and place them in a circle. She said that the Great Spirit gave us the teachings of the seven rocks called Nishwaswe Mashomasug seven grandfathers. Each rock represents a quality of how we treat ourselves and others. The first rock represents wisdom. I must use that wisdom for my people. The second rock represents respect. I must respect everyone, all human persons and all the things that are created. The third rock represents love. I must love all my brothers and sisters and share with them. The fourth rock represents honesty. I must be honest in every action and provide good feelings in my heart. The fifth rock represents bravery. I must do things even in the most difficult of times. The sixth rock represents humility. I must teach the youth to know that he or she is equal to everyone else, no better or no less, just the same as everybody else. The last rock represents truth. I must be true in everything that I do, be true to myself and true to fellow humans. I must always respect the truth. Nokmis told me to take the rocks, bundle them so that we can take them to Mishomas for his sweat lodge. I took off my jacket and bundled the rocks and we continued our journey home. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, God of hope and promise, flesh and spirit entwined to become one with you through Jesus Christ. As heaven and earth connect, so too may we through responding to your word. Increase, increase our depth of understanding as we receive the words of scripture this day. God of eternal life, teach us to keep on the path of righteous living, which so many have traveled before. Amen. Christian stories are powerful shapers of reality because they help us imagine where we came from and why we are here. Indigenous peoples have such stories that give guidance and ground them in the earth the Creator has made. Eurocentric Christians tend to hold the words of Genesis 1 and 2 as creation stories. And the short passage we are about to hear has had a powerful, and many would increasingly say negative, effect on the Eurocentric way of relating to the earth. So let's listen now and wonder if there might be a better way. 
Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Here ends the reading from Genesis. When looking for a compass to guide your life and faith, you can't do better than the teachings we are about to hear. Matthew's gospel is filled with stories and parables of Jesus, all meant to help us discover in him the Christ. But we know not everyone in the story will agree. In one such encounter, Jesus is tested by an adversary. Who is this man, and what does he really know? How aligned is he with the faith taught in the temple, the faith, you might say, of the status quo? To find out, let's listen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducee, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. For the truth which holds our living, for the truth that challenges and changes us, for the truth that sets us free, thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. Great creator, sustainer, and redeemer God, bring us closer into your dream for this world, May we listen with open hearts and minds to the message of good news that you have for each of us and for our community as a whole. With our brother Jesus' help, we ask this. Amen. It's Indigenous Day of Prayer in the United Church, and who is ready to celebrate? Today is a day that we set apart in our church's calendars of celebrations to honor neighbors, relatives, kin, that most of us don't, probably don't get to see very often. Or maybe that's not quite right, for it's possible that some of us have connections with Indigenous communities, either as family or friends, or wait for it, as neighbours. It's possible that in our neighbourhood, town or city, there are many Indigenous people that we haven't had the chance to meet yet. For so long, many of our congregations have been oriented around other communities, especially the dominant, often white, Eurocentric communities who came to these shores as Methodists, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists. For so long, many of us have only gotten to know Indigenous peoples by meeting them on television, or in the news, or in the movies leaving our heads swimming in often narrow and negative stereotypes of who they are rather than the truth. Quite simply, simply, Indigenous peoples, like all people, are our neighbours. And what else can we conclude after hearing, from, hearing this from Matthew's Gospel? Jesus is so clear to the lawyer who asks him the question about what following God and true religion is all about. It's about love, he says. Love for God, love for self, and love for neighbor as yourself. Jesus' answer stops the lawyer in his tracks, and it can stop us in ours too. 
This is a core teaching in our faith that suggests that paying attention to neighborliness, how we love our neighbors, maybe especially the ones we don't get to see very often, is essential to celebrating who Christ is and who we are as we follow Jesus day by day. Jesus was not one to stop finding neighbors at the end of the block or within one religious or social or ethnic community. We know from the Gospels he was constantly on the move back and forth between diff different, often rival groups. He seemed to have no fear of arguing with the elite lawyers, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, or even Romans who defined the power structure of his time and place. He likewise recognized, spoke, ate with, and healed people of Syrophoenician background, Samaritan background, humble people, those with no claim to power, fortune, or fame. To Jesus, God opened up possibility for relationship, friendship, where others saw only reason to condemn. His capacity to see a friend in the stranger is humbling, isn't it? And I often wonder how he managed it on a day-to-day -day practical basis. Can you really go through life thinking that the whole world is your neighbor? It's a question that becomes especially captivating for a celebration of kinship like the one that we gather for today. You see, for many indigenous peoples, one could say that the whole world actually is their neighbor. The traditional teachings of many nations have not long acknowledged the essential oneness, the essential neighborliness of all living and non-living beings. Traditional knowledge, passed down from generation to generation, has opened up a spirituality, a rich horizon of neighbors that includes not only clans and kin of a particular tribe or nation, but also kinship with the essential elements of life such as air and the waters and the land with its plants and animals. And let us just sit with that for a moment, kinship with all of creation. For many indigenous peoples, what you would call the gifts of creation, the plants and animals, the birds of the air, the fish in the sea, the land warmed up by the sun by day and lit by the moon at night, these gifts are as much neighbors as we are to each other. This is wisdom that comes from indigenous peoples' experience of living in this land for generations. Rather than hold a dominion model over creation, such as the one we inherit from our ancient Judeo-Christian myth in Genesis 1, many indigenous peoples celebrate stories of how creation taught them how to be human, how to live respectfully and with honor among all creators, all creators' other beautiful creatures. It's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different orientation to what and who are kin. And very sadly, it's a beautiful part of the gifts Indigenous peoples offered to share, but were rejected when our settler ancestors came to these shores. The consequences for holding such differing understandings about being neighbors have been devastating. Devastating to the generations whose ancestors signed treaties with the crown, expecting to share in the abundance of these lands with the newcomers, not dispossessed by it. Devastating to the generations who increasingly found themselves outnumbered by the newcomers, pouring into their traditional territories, newcomers who had no conception of how the land was to be treated, no conception of how to live interdependently with the animals and plants, with the waters and the air. 
In other words, no concept of how to be a good neighbor. Instead of recognizing the offer to share the land and the settling peoples saw the land as ripe for the taking. Treaties were broken, reserves were created, and residential schools were built. A whole government apparatus was put together to control indigenous peoples and their lands, attempting to reduce sovereign nations to wards of the state. Attempting, and still at it now. We who benefit from this system, people who see the land not as living and sacred, but as patches of ground to fence off, resources to exploit, we are caught up in the sins of our ancestors. So many of us don't see the lie upon which so much of Canada and our wealth is built. And this continued unwillingness to recognize our failure to be good neighbors to the peoples into whose, whose lands we moved is a cause of grief not only for Indigenous peoples, but also to others who are our neighbors. The land, waters, air and trees, plants, trees, animals, and the fish upon we all depend. Despite all the harm, colonization has brought to neighbors, Jesus would have us love to celebrate that indigenous peoples are our neighbors. If Jesus was here, can you imagine what he might suggest we do? Hmm. He once told a lawyer who was sent to trick him his summary of faith. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. By reaching out to meet indigenous neighbors, we can signal we're catching up at last. Jesus had no reason to fear anyone that he met because he knew each person already to be kin to him as gifts of God. To follow his lead, neither should we. With God's help, may it be so. We now reach the part in our service where we sort of become quiet and went inward and we've listened and now we're preparing ourselves to meet the world. 
And part of our meaning the world is responding to the world. And part of responding is offering of ourself to the world. So however you wish to interact, whatever you would like to offer the world, and especially up to God, for God to work through, to offer hope into the world, let us take a moment to do that right now. Whatever you have that you want to offer, let us offer that to God. Let us pray. Holy One, there are many different gifts, reflecting the wondrous diversity of creation, with all of us being made in your image and likeness. We offer ourselves the labor of our minds and hands in our desire to follow you in word and deed. We offer the joy in our hearts for gifts of safety, sanctuary, and unconditional love and our desire that all may be affirmed their place in your creation. In the name of Jesus, who lifted up the ones who did not always receive affirmations, encouragement, and a holy anointing, we make this prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we come together as a human family, blessed to be alive, blessed to be on this land, blessed to have neighbors as diverse as your creation. You surround us with air we breathe, water we drink, all manner of living plants and animals that delight us and sustain us. Thank you, Creator, for all you provide. And we take a moment in silence to ponder the blessings that you give us of family, friends, places to call home, the food we eat, the web of life in which we, with all creatures, live, move, and have our being. Hear us as we give thanks. Oh God, we thank you for indigenous neighbors and friends this day. And yet, we lament too. We lament that historic and contemporary racism continues to mar our relations. We lament the church's role as beneficiaries of an economic and governance system that privileges settler people at the expense of First Nation peoples of this land. We lament apathy in the face of the need for change. Change that recognizes the sovereignty of the first peoples and recognizes at long last in ways that make a difference. The sacredness of the land and the need for all of us to walk humbly upon it. Oh God, for the witness of strength, caring and love of indigenous peoples and for the struggle for what is just and right, open our hearts this day. Encourage us to listen more, speak less, participate in the movements for change that will bring us together in good and respectful ways. Encourage us to make friends, get to know someone's story and share our stories too, without fear. For in Christ we know we are all kin, relatives with you and with each other and with all living and non-living things. So hear us now as we pray for those hurting and in pain in all of our communities. <clears throat> for anyone worn down by systemic racism, including by government and by the church, that white people and those with power will change their thinking and how they live so justice will finally come. For 
for anyone suffering the injustice of racial profiling, ending up involved with the law and incarcerated in prisons at a higher rate than other populations, that policing will change so justice will finally come. For survivors of residential schools and their families that continue to live with that legacy, that justice will finally come. For people living on reserves with shortages of funds for decent housing, water, water treatment, schools, and other community infrastructure, that justice will finally come. For Indigenous neighbours living in urban areas, facing the challenges of prejudice and discrimination, for those living with PTSD and addiction, that justice will finally come. For Indigenous women and girls, facing the two evils of racism and sexism, that their lives and bodies will be respected as sacred, that justice might finally come. For those Indigenous women and girls who are among the thousands of murdered and missing, for them and their families, our lament the shame of what has happened and our pledge to advocate for their safety that justice will finally come. For the air that all might breathe it clean and free, for the waters, marshlands, lakes, rivers, streams, for the great seas and oceans, that they might be protected for the benefit of seven generations hence, that justice will finally come. for the lands, forests, grass, and farmlands, for the prairies, foothills, and mountains, for their beauty, for the life that teems within, upon, and over them, for the reprioritization of the health of ecosystems over profit, so justice will finally come. For the animals, birds, fish, and life of all kinds, whose viability is being threatened by unsustainable human, acti human activity, that their lives will begin to count so that justice will finally come. All this, as well as the prayers of our hearts, O oh God, we lift up to you for the father figures in our lives, for those that have moved and are readying themselves to move to new homes, for our Muslim cousins, for our LGBTQ plus friends and family during Pride Month. Hear our celebrations as we claim anew our kinship with you and with all our relations. Hear our laments and grow our hearts full of compassion for self and others as we leave this place to be a better friend and neighbor to all. We pray in the name of Creator, who is mother and father of us all. We pray as well in the spirit of Christ, whose words continue to guide our lives today as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
as God's united yet diverse peoples, we go to become neighbors to each other and to the earth, for in Christ we are all kin. We are called to be neighbors, to share generously with each other. As we learn more, respect more, love more, we all gain more, not lose. God as creator will be our rock. Christ and spirit will be our guides. We go forth with the blessing, with the love, with the acceptance of the God that is known to us as our creator, our sustainer, and our glorious redeemer. And let the people say, Amen. Friends, I hope wherever you are that you are safe and things are slowly starting to open up. So best wishes as you book your appointments for your second vaccine. And I also hope that you're able to enjoy the summer that is stretching beautifully before us. May we be rested, rejuvenated, and hopefully be back in person in the fall. But for now, God bless and be safe.